here today. Amen. The wind is tricky. So we, we were in Acts, in case you weren't here before. Um, Acts kicked off, as you remember, with Jesus with the disciples, uh, the resurrected Jesus with the disciples for 40 days, talking to them, chatting to them, educating them, revealing the Old Testament to them. 40 days is quite a long time to be with people. Um, and then he was taken up into heaven, he is into heaven. And then as we celebrated a couple of weeks ago, Pentecost happened, the beginning of the church. So the disciples, there's maybe 120 people then, believers. Uh, and on Pentecost, the tongues of fire, as you remember, came rested on individuals. They spoke in different languages. People thought they were drunk, although it was nine o'clock in the morning. And Peter was able to give his first sermon, which asked the people who were gathered to find out what was going on to repent and convert and be baptized. And 3,000 were added that day. So the church started. And then in, in um, chapter 3, so they began to meet together as we are now and hang out together. Again, not in a building. And then in chapter 3, uh, we hear about uh, Peter and John going into the temple and seeing this beggar who's been there for not just a few months or a few years, probably decades. Every day been in the same place, carried to the same place. Lame from birth, we hear. So imagine someone sitting in between the pub and the church here on the roundabout uh, for maybe 20, 30 years. Every day you walk past him, he's there with his mat and maybe a cardboard sign asking for change. And we walk past him and we maybe give him some money. We can't do it. He's, he's lame from birth. And imagine that person. You see that person healed. That person jumps up. It's, it's an unbelievable miracle. That's what's just happened here in chapter 3. And Jesus is not around. This is Peter and John. So the Holy Spirit is with them. And that miracle happens. And so now we're picking up in uh, chapter 4, read beautifully by Marion, um, as Peter and John are in the temple. And not surprisingly, a crowd gathers. So this chap has been healed. Everyone knows him. The whole of Jerusalem probably knows this guy. They've walked past him thousands of times. Jesus would have walked past him a few times, but probably <laughs> deliberately didn't heal him, uh, waiting for this moment for him to be healed. So this crowd gathers. Everyone sees this. They're, 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 they come together, um, and Peter and John are there in Solomon's colonnade. Uh, and I wonder how we would react to a situation like that. I often talk to people, you know, not Christians. They say, yeah, I kind of get it. But I, I, I believe maybe if I saw a miracle. But I wonder really whether they would believe if they saw a miracle. I mean, how many miracles did it take for people to still not believe? Lazarus was raised from the dead. And a few days later, Jesus was crucified because of that. So I'm not sure miracles in themselves do the trick. I think what the difference is, the Holy Spirit, and that is what has been guiding Peter in his second sermon, which he delivers now to this assembled crowd. And guided by the Spirit, Peter delivers this killer sermon um, and convicts this crowd that they have killed the author of life. They've killed the author of life, which is a pretty harsh thing to say, but it convicts them to their hearts and... 5,000 people are added to the church at that time. 5,000 men. Uh, 5,000 men would probably mean about maybe 15, 20,000 people. So that's the size of the crowd watching the Champions League last night. That's quite a lot of people. These are new Christians, but they're in the temple, in the Jewish temple. So that's not going to go well, I don't think, as it doesn't. I can't hold my Bible over, so I'll just go over here. Um, so verses 1 to 3, we read that the priests, the Sadducees, the temple guard are greatly disturbed. The priests and the captains of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. No wonder they were greatly disturbed because... 
this actually the word disturbed used here is probably stronger than our word disturbed it's really shaken to their core because this is against everything that they stand for once again this movement is rising and they can't do anything about it the sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection for a start they didn't believe in miracles they didn't believe in angels so everything that peter and john were preaching was absolutely against what they believed and 5,000 people are added to the number on that day so this is the beginning of persecution this is the start of the church being persecuted and you ask why the church is persecuted they seized peter and john and because it was evening they put them in jail until the next day the truth about jesus is really offensive to the ruler of this world which is a world of darkness the prince of darkness hates the name of jesus so by talking about jesus of nazareth they are absolutely offending these high priests and those who don't believe so persecution starts but in in persecution in persecution so the church is able to grow because without the pressure of persecution the early church you know like us and a few hundred others would have probably stayed at a jerusalem country club you know meeting together hanging out having a nice time like a commune nothing wrong with that just stay to ourselves we won't bother anyone we won't offend anyone we'll just be we'll maybe go up to the hills have a bit of the sing song but this persecution which starts here the pressure of it encourages and begins the growth of the church but persecution um i mean i don't know about you i don't suffer loads of persecution i do as i'm sure you guys do if you talk about jesus try talking about jesus at a at a dinner party or if you're having drinks with someone just say don't just say my church or my faith or something because that's easy isn't it? we've all got a church but just say jesus of nazareth and see how people react or jesus christ without the swear word intention of it but if you mention the word of jesus people react and, and in my experience with my mates mostly who are not christians they they're like oh lord so do you have to really don't go onto your religious thing it's a negative reaction normally the name of jesus but that's i mean that sort of persecution is pretty tolerable um which i'm sure you've had friends family alienate you wonder if you're a nutter bible basher jesus freak whatever else terms it is um i think we can handle that the early church had it a bit rough though to put it mildly following this persecution in acts uh, there was 300 years of intense persecution of the christians um 10 phases historically documented things like uh, i hope this isn't too offensive but sewing people into animal skins and feeding them to to wild beasts um covering them in uh, oil or tar and setting fire to them and using them as torches for your party um, boiling people scourging them racking them beheading them uh, the, the persecution of the early church was was pretty intense but actually that persecution allowed the church to grow people were moved to further areas they spread across the world so that persecution that pressure enabled the church to grow and it's it's going to keep going until the end we know this is going to happen more intensely in fact probably the more intense the better uh florence actually talked to me the other day about the church in nigeria i don't know if you know florence florence sitting there um which is undergoing intense persecution at the moment the christian community in the north of nigeria uh, i looked at this just uh, yesterday over one and a half thousand people have been killed just in the last few months in northern nigeria for their christian faith not from being in the wrong place at the wrong time but because they are christians that's a lot of people children women uh, and men killed for their faith so persecution is very real in parts of the world uh, very real and just because we don't have a version of it doesn't mean it's happening and maybe actually we probably want to question why the western church doesn't have a lot of persecution maybe we're a bit comfortable here maybe we're a bit sleepy 
maybe we're not in people's faces in the same way that perhaps we should be. Maybe we're not talking about Jesus at a dinner party. And we might get a bit of persecution, which is a good thing. Um, but we will definitely pray for that church in Nigeria uh, later. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Today. So what do you do with persecution? What do Peter and John do with persecution? Well, we read it in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. This is the same Peter who gives them both barrels. Uh, the people who killed Jesus, the same crowd, Caiaphas, Anna, Annas, uh, his mates and family. But this is the same Peter who only a short while ago was outside the temple, warming himself by the fire, denying Jesus to a servant girl, um, who now is inside the temple, full of fire, and talking and proclaiming the truth about Jesus and the only way that can have happened to him and the only way it could happen to us is through the power of the Spirit there's, there's no way we can do this stuff on our own um, Peter and John and the rest of them would have died out as a sort of extreme sect if it hadn't been for Pentecost and for the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives Peter actually says um, The stone you builders rejected has become the capstone. The stone you builders rejected. Not the Romans, that's a quote from Psalm 118. But the stone you, the Jewish leaders, rejected has become the capstone. I was thinking about that in relation to this building here, which is this bit of the building, Gordon will tell us, is a thousand years old. This bit here with the wonky stones. Am I right, Gordon? Yes. Um, and that window behind Ben, the little window, I think is the oldest part of the church. A thousand years, this piece of the building has been here. Um, I was trying to work out which would have been the capstone, the cornerstone of this part of the building. And I can't see a very obvious one. There's some pretty wonky uh, capstone looking things on this building. Um, but nonetheless, the question I suppose for us is, what is the cornerstone in our lives? It's the stone that you lay at the beginning of a building to enable everything else to be measured off it. What is the cornerstone in your life? What's the capstone in your life? Is it other stuff? Stuff of the world? Yeah, family, fair enough. Is it, is it uh, your work? Is it whatever other things you live for? Or is it Jesus, that name, Jesus? Is Jesus the cornerstone of your life? Because, like the early church, we could go quietly into the hills and uh, hang out as a lovely community like we are now and chat and have coffee and uh, enjoy ourselves. Or, or, as I believe we need to do, we, we, we need to be filled with the Spirit to be able to go out to others and to share the Gospel and to maybe receive some persecution. Um, and the effect here in Acts chapter 4 is phenomenal, as you, as we just heard. Just read. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, which is fair enough, they, they kind of were that. If we have been called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but who God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There is no other name in heaven. There's no other route to salvation. There is no other route except through the name of Jesus, which is why we need to talk about him. And I recognize that's really tough and I find that difficult in my own life. But I just encourage you, if you haven't uh, felt the Holy Spirit in your life or invited the Spirit to come into your life, to actually be with you, to give you that bold courage, to enable you to be able to talk about Jesus, to share the gospel with others. Um, if you haven't had that, I'd, I'd really encourage you, and you'll know if you've had it, and you probably know if you haven't, and there's not a wrong or right place to be there but I, I would encourage you to be able to bring the Holy Spirit into your life and it's very simple all we have to do which we did at the beginning of this service 
is repent, as Peter said. Just say sorry for the stuff you've done wrong and ask him to come in and he will come, as he did on the day of Pentecost. And shook buildings, created a church which grew by thousands and now millions and billions on the planet today. So can you honestly say that the Spirit is with you? Have you felt the Spirit guide involved in you? If not, how can you hope to defend yourself against not just persecution, but all of the worries and dramas of the world, all of the illness and sorrow and death and separation, all of that is going to happen and has happened to many of us. How can you cope with that unless you have the Spirit? Otherwise, we will be overwhelmed. So I just, um, in a moment of quiet now, listening to the birds, there was a magpie squawking who felt like he was trying to take over, but luckily the songbirds are out now. In a moment of quiet, if you just um, happy to shut your eyes, maybe open your hands out and just even now um, ask for the Holy Spirit to come into your life. If he's not been there before, then why not use this moment to just ask for the Spirit to come into your life. So Father, uh, just if there's one person even here today, we ask that in your power, as you did for the early church, you pour your spirit into the life of that person, of us as a congregation, as a community, so that we as individuals and as a group can defend ourselves against persecution and against all of the troubles of this world. So we ask that in the name of Jesus, who we are not afraid to talk about and to pray to. Amen. Right.